All right. Darnell, Craig, thank you for joining us for part two, part two. Uh, but I guess we'll be talking about more than angels, but it is part two because the audience loved you. You were so amazing on the last broadcast. How you been? I've been doing good, man. I'm glad to be back. It's dope. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, they loved you. They loved uh, the way that you put things, the way that you um, you made it tangible for them. Um, today, I want to talk about the prophetic. And I also want to kind of talk about the supernatural. So we'll just go in and out concerning these um, two topics. When I, when I mentioned the prophetic uh, for you, I know you have a different way of seeing it. Um, can you explain that for us? tonight yeah absolutely um so i've been in the prophetic since i was a kid um my first encounter with god i had to be about i think six or seven years old we were in a church and um the person prayed for me and um everyone would fall out under the power of god so i remember being a kid i was like hey i'm gonna fall when they i'm gonna fall and take a nap you know i'm, I'm on that type of time so they uh laid hands on me and i remember i made myself fall but when i hit the ground i went into a vision and God made it so simple. And what I heard was the voice of God. And I saw this big hand and I saw like cash money. And I heard God's voice. And he said, tell these people that money is coming into their hands and I want to give them a brand new building. And I remember I was just like, I started crying. And I'm thinking I'm like seven, eight, whatever. I started crying. I said, mama, mama, I said, I had this, I heard his voice. I heard his voice. And she was like, oh, what did he say? And I told her and they brought me up in front of the church and I prophesied it and it came true. Um, one of the, the person's brother ended up being Bo Jackson. I believe he gave the money for a building and they got a building. I just went through crazy warfare after that. I started having like desires to kill myself, desires to drown myself, desires to set myself on fire, like weird occurrences. And I remember they had to do a deliverance on me when I was young. And um, I kind of went blind to that, forgot about all that stuff. Um, about 17, I got awakened again. I started dreaming. You know, and I would have dreams about the world ending. I had dreams about dying and going to hell. I had dreams about the person I was going to be in the future. And that's when I kind of got my introduction to the prophetic again. I remember being in DHR, being um, in the temporary custody of my pastor. And I remember a woman prophesied to me. She said, young man, the Lord says you're a circle and not a square. Stop trying to fit in. She said, God says you're going to be a leader in your generation. God says you're going to be in business who's traveling the world. And God says, you're going to be a mouthpiece in your generation. Now, when she's saying that to me at that point, no value, no hope, no self-worth, rejected, all this stuff. But when God spoke to me, God gave me hope. So I had something to look forward to. So for me, when you talk about the prophetic, um, I like how Albert Einstein has this quote. He says that, you know, the imagination is a preview of life's comes attractions. But I like to say that about the prophetic, that the prophetic is a preview of what's to come. And for me, uh, with the prophetic, I love giving people that same feeling that I have, I had. So I like being able to see into what's coming so people have hope that they can overcome their present circumstances and they can have something to look forward to. So for me, if I describe the prophetic, we would describe the prophetic like God's, um, um, I guess one of the best parables we can use is the Internet. You know how the Internet, you know, houses so much information, houses so much data, um, so much insight. But the prophetic will be similar to, you know, the Internet where you tune into the frequencies of God and you're able to. Some frequencies would be comfort. Some frequencies would be encouragement. Some frequencies would be edification. But then prophets are able to access a higher frequency and they're able to access the future. And make people aware of, you know, why they went through things they went through, um, what where God is in their present season or what's to come in the future. So for me, my worldview in the prophetic was different. You know, as I grown up in the prophetic, I realized a lot of people, you know, there are con certain contemporary voices that shaped and influenced their mind. But I come from a different background on um, the apostle I was under, um, Apostle Greer. He was a um, he's a prophetic apostle, but he he pioneered a uh, prophetic academia. So what they would do is at that time, it was ahead of his time. You know, he had like Marsh Ronda down there, um, John Paul Jackson, um, all these different prophetic voices from around the country, prophetic apostolic voices. But what they would do, they would train prophets. So I was able to, my coming to God, when I lived with my pastor, he had this tub in his house and the tub was full of all their conferences. So I would be listening to a tape 
from 2000 called the symbiosis of prophetic ministry march on i'll be listening to um a tape about a nation within a nation from apostle sunstar peterson like all these different voices that that was my milk so i grew up in the prophetic so i had a different worldview so when i came into the contemporary movement you realize that you know a lot of this stuff was very basic and it was a very um very basic fundamental you know but i was exposed to like a cutting edge view so it was a little different yeah something i love that you said if we can backtrack a little bit you said that you were you were a child seven years old and i know that there are a lot of parents who are going to listen to this broadcast and they're going to say hey you know i have a child who has had encounters with um the supernatural um, and then to have experienced some of the things that you talked about where this it's almost like one realm was opened and another one was as well um, mm-hmm. that caused um, alternative, uh, not alternative, but like a lot of backlash, I guess, spiritual backlash. So can you speak to that? Like as far as like what should parents do when their child is experiencing this and they don't know what to do? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So one of the things that I always tell, you know, the parents that I mentor is that, uh, first of all, children are very pure and children have an ability to hear God or perceive the spirit at a realm that's higher than adults. It takes adults a lot more cultivation and a lot more development. But for the things that are hard for you spiritually are easy for children. Like I would go to kids sometimes like, what is Jesus saying? And they'll just start prophesying and they could it would be amazing to hear the stuff that the kids would say. But you have to understand as a parent that your responsibility is to make Jesus simple for your children. You know, you ain't, you ain't getting into deep stuff, you know, or whatever, but you're teaching them how to pray, how to hear God and that Jesus loves them. And you're teaching them at a young age how to be a friend of God. You also want to be aware that just like the devil has a um, just like God has a plan for people. The devil has a plan for people. And the way you raise up your child, you're going to steer them toward the devil's plan or toward God's plan. So you being a guardian of your child, just be aware that your role is to introduce them to the Lord at an early age. Because um, if you have a child that's called to be a prophet or a child that, you know, um, that has a prophetic call in their life or whatever, you you can always go back to the story of Samuel. God, Jesus manifesting himself to Samuel at a very young age. And Samuel did not know Jesus. But Eli knew Jesus, even though Eli had so going on in his house, he knew Jesus. And there are going to be times where God's going to be speaking to your children. And you want to make sure that you're in a posture or a position where you know the voice of God and you can perceive what God is doing. Because there are times where God will visit your children for where he wants to take them at a very young age. And if Samuel did not have Eli, Samuel would have not been able to navigate what was happening to him. So, you know, he went to Eli, he said, did you call me? And he said, I didn't call you. You know, that was, that's normal. I didn't call you. And then he had this experience again. He said, hey, you know, did you call me? And then he began to realize it's something going on here. A lot of times your children will come to you with, I had a dream or I saw this or I see this and you'll just shut it down. But your role as a parent is to have them navigate what they're experiencing And also, even when it comes to the demonic realm, you have to be able to help your children navigate what they're experiencing, because quite frankly, there are certain things that happen to your children because of what you've done. So I remember there was a guy, um, he's a he's a a prophet now. But when he was a kid or when he was younger, he was in witchcraft. He was like a warlock. And what happened was he had a child. His son was like two or three years old. His son began to have nightmares. Now, there, there are arenas in the spirit where you can develop, and he's so spiritually developed that when his wife was pregnant, he knew she was pregnant because he felt a spirit come into the atmosphere, and he was trying to figure out what it was, and he's like, it has to be a child. So he's in his room, but he still has a, level, or a measure of rule. So he feels this spirit in the other room, and he's just observing. And that's how spiritual things work anyway. We always say that phrase, that in the spirit, there's no distance. When you awaken to the realm of the spirit, you can be in multiple places at the same time. Like you could, you could access other arenas, access other locations. Like, like if you look at the Bible with Elisha, when Gehazi went to Naaman, he asked, he asked, um, Elisha asked Gehazi, he's like, where were you? And he said, oh, you know, I was did it. He said, do you not know that when you left, my spirit went with you? So naturally I'm here, but my spirit is with you. So that's a whole nother thing in itself. But He's observing his child and what's happening to the child. 
And when he realizes it's happening, you know, he waits for him to call him. He calls him and he said, hey, listen, I want to apologize to you. And he said, this is happening because of what I've done. So he walked him through this and he repented to the child. He prayed for the child and he said, listen, it's going to come back. He said, but when it comes back, this is what you do. And he waited, you know, the next day or whatever. He felt that demonic spirit again and he observed what his child did. But this time his child was equipped by his parent and his child dealt with the spirit and it didn't happen again. But then it ended up happening to his next son. But this is what you call a generational curse. There are times where people can be involved in stuff and be visited. If you look at me and my situation, something in my bloodline felt like it had a right to me. And when I prophesied, it manifested because now your plan is overthrown. You know, I remember I, I was telling one of my friends the other day, actually, I remember there was a guy on the side of the road that had lost his mind and was like screaming. Da, 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 da. And I remember Apostle Greer had prophesied to me when he was talking to me and he was like, the devil wants your mind to break down and he wants you to be that person that'll be on the side of the road with their mind lost. And every time I saw that person, I was like, wow, that was the devil's plan for me. So the plans were so vast. The devil wanted me to lose my mind and be insane and go crazy. But then God's plan was for me to be a voice in my generation. But these are two different um, possibilities that could have been helped by your mentorship or by your parental guidance. So that's pretty deep. I like that. Yeah, that is pretty deep. I'm thinking about um, the the different plans that have that are presented, the different plans that can be for anybody's life. Um, even when I prophesy, I think of it like choose your own adventure. I talk about that in my book, Simply Prophetic, about how it's just like choose your own adventure, kind of like, hey, I'm telling you that this is a prophetic plan that the Lord has given me concerning your life. Now it is up to you to seek those things out and to truly, um, well, to there's some, some action behind it. There's some action behind it, right? So there's a prophecy, Alexis, you're going to be the football player, blase, blase, woo, woo, woo. Ten years later, I do. But I had to get on a plane and go to Tampa, Florida. I had to have been open to what God was speaking in my ear. I didn't know that I would meet him uh, there, but God was leading me, guiding me. And I think obedience is the biggest thing with the prophetic but, you know, there also could have been a plan at the same time I was dating another guy who was in the streets, you know, there could have been a plan that I would have been with him too. You know what I'm saying? And so I remember this lady had a dream one time that I was going to, um, this is when James and I were dating and I think we had just became engaged, but I kind of was like, I just don't know. Do I want to talk to the other guy or him? And I, I told, I've shared this with the audience. I just kind of was struggling in my mind. Like my mom struggled in her mind. Like she struggled with bipolar, like my siblings, six of them have had impact in their mind. I'm the only one who have not yet, you know, I mean, I don't I'll cancel that in the name of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Who nothing, who I'm straight. So anyway, I was like, yeah, I don't think that I'm going to be with him. I told James this. I don't think I want to be together. So do you know this woman had a dream that same night? She said, I had a dream that you went back to this guy that you was dating. There was cocaine everywhere. Now, my mom was a drug addict. Okay, she she was on drugs. So she said in this dream that I went to this dude, there was blood, cocaine, et cetera. And I left James because he, it, he was in this house that was like not fully built. Now, this is when we first was dating about eight years ago. But it was like, God stopped me right then. Like, if you go back to that dude, <laughs> you're going to be, look, you know, your mama was on this. this is, you're, you're the path, right? So what do you think about that? Like, there are paths and plots that seemeth, there's a way that seemeth right to a man at the end thereof is death. But you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's that's crazy. As if I just got two things to say. Two things stood out to me when you said that. Uh, one is quick. One is more extensive. The first one would be, I always tell prophets when you prophesy to people, there are four voices you can choose from. So you're going to choose from the voice of God. That's going to be the correct voice. You also can choose from the voice of their own desires. You also can choose from the voice of um, the voice of their family or their loved ones. And the last one you could choose from is the voice of Satan. And a lot of times this is why people, they'll receive a word and the word feels off because they're not prophesying from the voice of God. Because once again, when you talk about the spirit realm, once again, the spirit realm is a realm where you receive insight. And whoever your intention or whoever your consecration, whoever your focus is on, you're going to receive from that realm. So 
there are there are voices that you can hear in the realm of the spirit that aren't the voice of God. But you have to cultivate a familiarity with the voice of God so you can know the voice of God when you hear it. Because the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. They know my voice and the voice of a stranger they won't follow. But sometimes you have people that aren't familiar with the voice of God and they'll prophesy to us. But they have not developed that intimacy where they know God's voice above all. So they'll they'll wrongly prophesy because like sometimes I had these weird visions. Like I was telling my friend how when I feel God's presence, I go into visions of fog and vapor. But I know that it's, it begins to swirl around me and I know God is doing something. But when I think about the prophetic, I just think about sound waves. I think about frequencies. So when I'm when I'm thinking about the prophetic, I just perceive a certain frequency like going through my being. But once that frequency goes through your being, you know if this is the voice of God or not. A lot of people are not familiar enough with God to be able to pull, not pull down, be able to reject this frequency and realize that's not the voice of God. This is what they want for themselves. This is what their family wants for them. This is what the devil wants for them. And you'll see people be like, I see you dying. I see death all around you. That's not God's plan. But because you're not familiar with that frequency, you're going to choose the voice of the devil and you're going to prophesy the devil's will of a person. Or they'll be like, I, I see you getting married to this person. Actually, their mom really wants them to marry that person. But because you don't have enough familiarity with God, you can't tell the difference between God's will and that will. So that's that. I think that's very important because if we're going to raise prophets up, you have to have a place of consecration, you know, and you have to really be dedicated to the uh, to have a relationship with God because you can't always re just rely on your gift. The gift is incredible. But the thing about a gift is a gift is just like a satellite that makes you receive. But a gift could be turned in the wrong position and you could receive wrongly. But it's the relationship that protects you when you prophesy. Number two, one thing that's very interesting about what you said is we have these things called, um, it's in the Bible, they call it the book of the generations of Christ and they call it the book of the generations of Adam. So when you're prophesying to a person, we talk about two plans, you have a plan according to your bloodline and according to the flesh. But then also you have a plan according to Christ, which is why the Bible says, unless a man you know, be born from above, he cannot perceive the kingdom of heaven. So let's talk about this. So when you talk about the prophetic, if a person is not a believer, they can't access the book of the generations of Christ. In other words, they can't perceive what's happening in heaven. They can't perceive what's coming out of heaven. They cannot perceive what heaven is planned. But there are people that are spirit workers and in other alternative positions. When they're prophesying to you, they're prophesying according to the book of the generations of, of Adam. This is where you have people that, you know, they get into um they get into um astrology and they're very heavy on the zodiac and stuff like that which is very interesting that we get into the zodiac but one thing that you have to be aware of when you talk about the book of the generations of christ the devil has a plan for you based on your generations that's why we have a thing called familiar spirits the familiar spirit is a spirit that studies your family and has a plan that you repeat the mistakes of your family so that your generation never breaks past the ceiling so if generational or the or familiar spirit is working, you're going to repeat the mistakes of your mom, your dad, all the mistakes where you perpetuate this generational curse. That's how that works. But God didn't leave you to your generations. So God gave you another birth. And when you receive this other birth being born out of heaven, now you have the DNA of God. And now you can be set free from your fleshly limitations. That's why communion is so important, by the way, because whenever you're taking communion, you're reminding yourself that you're born from above and it empowers you to overcome all your fleshly limitations and flaws. But what's interesting is when you talk about the prophetic or God's plan, when a true prophet is prophesying to you, God opens up the book of what Christ has planned for you since before the foundation of the world. And this prophetic voice is speaking about what God had in mind before creation. He's speaking about the predestination, God's purpose, God's plan, and God's will for your life. But when someone who isn't a believer um, is prophesying to you or speaking of your future, they're speaking about what has been planned according to the flesh or what has been planned according to your bloodline. So much I have, so much right here that I'm thinking, Whew. okay, let me just get to it. Um, a couple of things I remember um, during the time that I went to, when I first met my husband, I went to uh, Tampa and I remember um, when I was there, I met this guy at the, um, at, at, uh, 
the Hilton uh, at Hilton at the hotel. And the guy told me, he was like, Hey, you either was born in, um, he's like, I feel like you was born in April. You know, the people who sell you like packages and stuff. So mm -hmm. he was like, you was born in April or September. So me, I kind of was like, well, maybe like, wow. Like, you know, I'm prophetic. He like, is he, are you prophetic? He's like, yeah, I'm like a prophet at this church, but come to find out dude was clairvoyant. Okay. <laughs> He was like called himself a clairvoyant. All right. So anyway, dude was like kind of mixing. Right. He was kind of mixing and all this other stuff. But I had met with him and his um, wife. And that's when I found out really just. But I, I kind of at that time, I was like, OK, well, I had just came out of school kind of like, well, Alexis, you're not open minded. Maybe you're just tripping, whatever. Do you know later they said like a prayer for me, whatever. Do you know later my friend had a dream years later, she said, you receive like a prayer or deliverance or something that opened a door. And she's like, I see this couple that's like on this, um, they're on this, uh, in this, in front of this water, they, they were by water. They were like, so anyway, they were from Hawaii and she's like, I just feel like, although it was something, it was the good intentions. There was something bad behind it. Right now, mind you, I'm thinking like, well, I didn't say nothing. I ain't do no seance or nothing like nothing like that. But like it was something else off. In other words, dude knew like you was born in April based on energy or something. Like, I don't know what he was on based on not even energy. It was something about something. I don't know. But or September, he couldn't pinpoint it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of like a mix. It was mixed. And I think we see a lot of people who are mixed now in today's world, especially with like your TikTok or whatever. Like I literally had to repent for that. And I went to like a session on it, like, because I just, I think that I was just more like, especially coming out of school, you got more open to all types of stuff, but there's only one way, like is Jesus Christ. And people have to be really careful that even the elect, the Bible says, if possible, will be deceived. So I had to repent for that, that time, even for just whatever that it could have opened up in the dream. She was like, she saw like cameras and stuff like opening up crazy stuff. So I, I feel like, uh, this month, April, the Lord's been speaking to me about like, um, um, family stuff, family, blood, family stuff. So I went to see my family and, um, some good stuff happened. Like my auntie got saved at the, she ain't been saved for like, she's 60, but something bad. Well, I don't say bad, but I saw in front of my cousin's house, like all these, this cat and it was just kept being there. And I was like, what's up with this? Because my husband and us, we had just been, I don't know. My friend told me that her grandmother, when she was a kid, tried to teach her magic. She opened up a book and the book had a cat, two cats on it. Okay. So it's just a couple of things with cats and me. I just don't be with it. So anyway, I told my cousin, like, I think like you need to stop messing with those tarot cards and you need to stop messing with those crystals. Like I just told her, but based on the cat being there, it wasn't even their cat, you know? So she was like, I've been stopped watching that. I've been stopped doing that. And everybody don't got your beliefs, but I'm like, yo, it's opening up a door. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think sometimes people feel like just cause people may have some accuracy that they're right, but it opens up another door in your life. that's connected to, I guess the familiar spirit spirits studying your bloodline, just like that man who was prophesying to me or whatever had a familiar spirit. That's super deep. I think that, OK, in this generation, we overly emphasize accuracy. And the thing about it is a false prophet can be accurate, too. The Bible actually tells you in Deuteronomy chapter 13 that there are prophets that God sent in the midst of Israel to test them, which means that these prophets will prophesy. It will come true. But the Bible says they will lead you to other gods. So it's not about if the word comes true. It's about who do they represent and who are they getting you to follow? So you have people that move in power, which is why America, first of all, America is a babe in the spirit. America widespreadly did not become immersed in the spirit and so Azusa Street, which have all these other countries that had experienced the outpour in the spirit at a much greater capacity, which is why the 19th, um, the 20th century, I believe, was our um greatest, the 20th century was our greatest revolution of breakthrough. If you think about it, the spirit was pouring out, I believe, in Azusa Street widespread. From 1900 to 2000, that's when everything broke open, because once the spirit of God was poured out widespreadly in America, that's when we got most of our technology. That's when a lot of stuff started shifted, because now the spirit of God is more widespread. And now what's interesting when we talk about accuracy is when a person goes to Africa or they come to America in Africa, 
There are people that can move in power, but they don't serve God. And they know that there. But in this country, we think anybody that moves in power, they walk with God, which is why it's very important that you understand a principle called Christocentricity. And we talk about Christocentricity. Everything has to be about Christ, has to be in Christ, has to be through Christ. Because when you talk about being the spirit and you talk about spirit workers and all these different stuff, here's the thing. So we slow down some. So there's something that exists called witchcraft. And witchcraft means that I reject God's order and I establish my own. Witchcraft can be small and witchcraft can become greater. Witchcraft could be I'm a child. I'm not going to submit to my parent. That's witchcraft. Witchcraft can be I'm a wife. I'm not going to submit to my husband. That's witchcraft. Witchcraft can be, hey, I don't believe the Bible. I believe this. That's witchcraft because God has an ordinance. God has a structure. God has a government. And you reject God's order and say, I'm going to do it my own way. Now, when we talk about certain activities that people do, you have to be aware that there is a counterfeit and there is a true. There can be no true uh, without a counterfeit. There could be no counterfeit without the true. So we talk about some of the things that Alexis is talking about as it relates to things that people do. You just want to make sure in your heart that Jesus sits on the throne of your heart. You want to abdicate the throne of your heart to Jesus. When you allow Jesus to, to sit on the throne of your heart, he becomes the Lord. A lot of Christians know Jesus as Savior. He saved them, but they're not submitted to him. When you submit to Jesus and you allow him to sit on the throne of your heart, the quality of your life changes. And even the way you relate to him changes because he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? You can be saved and never know Jesus as Lord. But when you stand before the Lord, it's going to be about, did you know him as Lord? So you want to make sure that you're surrendered in your heart to Jesus. That's very important. Now, we talk about prophets and how that stuff works. When she's, when she's talking about mixture, that's very important because when we talk about mixture. One of the things that we see about the prophetic in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says that the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. And one thing that I like how Mark Sharona says it in his book he says that the language that God speaks is son, which means that every time God opens his mouth, he's talking about Jesus. And even if God is not talking about Jesus, literally, it means that what he's talking about is found in him. It's going to be done through him. And it's about him, because when God is speaking, it's about establishing his government. It says of the increase of his government, government, there will be no end. So whenever God is speaking, it's about establishing his government. And about establishing his rule and his reign through the heart of his people. So when you're listening to a prophetic word, if it's a void of kingdom, if it's a void of government, if it's void of the um his his government reigning and ruling and and taking territory or taking souls, it's not God. Also, one of the things you have to know about the prophetic is the prophetic is typified in two colors. You have silver and you have gold. Silver is the color of redemption. Gold is the color of revelation. If someone calls himself a prophet and their ministry is not revelatory or redemptive, it's not genuine prophecy, it's witchcraft. And there are a lot of people that call themselves prophets. When they open their mouth, there's no redemption. In other words, God has a plan to redeem what's been stolen or hijacked. So, for example, I can begin to prophesy to someone that's in witchcraft. And when I'm prophesying to them, I'm exposing witchcraft, not for my glorification, not for my offering. But I'm exposing witchcraft because God is revealing this exists. But he's also talking about what he's going to do because of it, and how it's going to get back. But then also prophecy has revelation. In other words, God is revealing what's been veiled to you. He's revealing what's going on, uh, what has happened or what's to come. But the Bible says a very interesting verse. It said a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. And one of the things I learned in my prophetic mentorship is that if a word is released that does not contain revelation and redemption is witchcraft. And that's how you can tell who's on and who's off. Because it's not about accuracy. It's about the prophetic is not about accuracy, because once again, demons can be accurate. And I want to say something so strongly, but I'm holding back a little bit. because I want to get into the flow. But demons don't know, hold back. You got it. We this are, you know, it's the Holy Spirit flow, but you can just love we're going to do it. Then. I'm a, Let's we'll, do we'll, it. We'll see how it goes then, because like I said, if you overly emphasize accuracy, that's how you get deceived. Because it's not about the accuracy, it's about the spirit behind a person's words. And it's also about the source of their insight. So, for example, um, 
the Bible says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the honor of a king to search it out. God is the only one in creation that can hold a secret. In other words, if you look at the Bible, it says that if the rulers of this age had known, then they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So God was so strategic that even though prophets were prophesying about Jesus all these years, the devil still didn't know God's plan. Prophets are saying what's going to happen, da, 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 but it was hidden from Satan. And he, he perceived that if I kill Jesus off, it's going to be over. He didn't know that Jesus would become a seed that's going to produce a harvest. So in his mind, my plan is to kill him. But because he was hidden from God's full plan, God used Satan to execute his plan. But that's interesting because when we talk about the source, God is omniscient. God is omnipresent and God is um, uh, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent and he's uh, omnipotent, which means he's all powerful. He's all knowing and he's everywhere. The devil is not all knowing. The devil is not everywhere. And the devil is not all powerful, contrary to popular belief. So when a prophet or prophetic voice is functioning in the prophetic realm, God is giving them a sliver of his omniscience, which means he knows it all. But in this moment, being used as a vessel, I have access to the omniscience of God and what God knows in that realm. He's making me aware of so you can have God's perspective. The only people that can source that are people that are born from above. So if I'm not born from above, the only thing I can source is things in the astral plane or, or things in the natural plane. So which means that if I'm out of Christ, I can tell you what is happening in your family. If I'm out of Christ, I can tell you what the devil has planned for you. If I'm out of Christ, I can tell you, you know, what's going on or whatever, because that stuff is in this realm. But when a genuine prophetic voice is speaking, they're speaking from heaven. Because as a prophetic voice or as a prophet, you're not bound to earthly times and seasons because the Bible says you've been raised up and made to sit with it in Christ. And we see that in the Bible because there's a type of people called the tribe of Issachar. If you're a genuine prophet, you want to function like the tribe of Issachar. And they understood the times and seasons, but it was not the times and seasons on earth. They would move from the times and seasons in heaven because in culture or historically, when the tribe of Issachar would function, it would be crazy in the natural. But they had insight about what was happening in heaven and they partnered with heaven so that heaven's will, will would be done. But we get so caught up in accuracy that we're not discerning the source. When this person is talking, does it glorify Jesus? Does this person even mention the name of Jesus? When this person is talking, does it cause you to fall more in love with Jesus? Does it point you more to Jesus? Does it lead you to a deeper relationship with Jesus? There's nothing that God will say that will not lead you to a greater relationship. The only reason God is speaking is because he wants you to have a deeper relationship with him. So could, when you leave this meeting, when you leave this session, when you leave this live, when you leave this conference, did you fall more in love with Jesus? Or did you fall in love with this person's gift, their personality? Did you fall more in love with you know their, their network or net worth, whatever? But that's how you can tell. It's the source that's behind it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there is so much now out that we see where people are just like going off of like, you know, I guess, you know, Instagrammable type stuff or like, you know, the the you got the the what's it called? The the the, the babes, the prophetic babe. I don't know what they call itself. <laughs> the bad babes or something like that, you know, the, the, and I'm speaking of like the women. Uh, with men, you have other things too, right? They be on some stuff too, like, you know, the tight pants and stuff like that. Like people be on that. And it's not necessarily like from an external, but I'm talking, but from a heart posture, right? You can tell a heart, a heart posture um, in the prophetic. So I try to stay away from a lot of it because it can really make me a woman who's been um, operating in it since 2006, kind of look at it like, man, this is like a joke, you know, <laughs> like it's like a joke. And I try in my meetings even not to, um, you know, I don't do a lot of uh, prophetic ministry anymore like that when it comes to one on one. I really am interested in prophesying globally. Uh, and the reason is because it's, I think that people have so many prof prophetic words that they just don't do anything with them or also just like they become junky. And I don't want to, you know, I'm here for edification, exhortation and strength. Even when I prophesy, you know, as far as like, you know, I get a name or something, I'm like shocked myself. Right. I'm in awe. Like, wow, I didn't even know, you know, but 
now I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, they do off like, hey, you got $25 in your pocket right now. And God is saying that, you know, da, 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 whatever. And people's like, oh my gosh, like, oh, yo, your social security number is this. Like, it's really like a lot of trickery. And you're right. A lot of people in Africa, when I've gone, they'll be like, hey, we already know this dude is smoking mirrors, but y'all love him. So whatever, like they just took it over there. We can't stop them because they got famous over there. And so we have to be very careful about what we allow to come into our ears because again the elect if possible can be deceived and how are you deceived by your own lust and your own desires right and so when you're hearing these individuals even by your own need to say hey I want to be prophetic I want to be a prophet I want to be on TV I want to be that whatever and so then people fall down a rabbit hole and next thing you know is next thing you know right there they're just out there and um you know trying to be a part of this whole um whatever culture and so we have to be sober and we have to be balanced but i guess i my question my next question would be for you is like how can people tell the real from the the fake absolutely you know jesus said it so simple he said that a, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit he said a bad tree cannot bear good fruit he said you don't go to a fig to look for thistles and neither you go through um a fig to look for thorns so you know a tree by its fruit Fruit has to do with character. Fruit has to do with lifestyle. And then fruit also, um, you know, because when you see someone's actions, that's a combination of their thoughts and their words, and it becomes who that person um, is. I think the biggest thing, once again, is that true prophets, when you talk about a genuine prophet, a genuine prophetic voice is speaking about God's will, God's plan, and God's purposes. The Bible says that false prophets speak of the world. It says, but true prophets, they're not speaking of the world. So when you see a prophet that's so inundated with cosmopolitan issues, they're they're trapped in creation. They can't access heaven's thoughts, heaven's frequencies, heaven's agenda. That's not a genuine prophet. When a prophet is mainly speaking to the marriage, the finances, things that are societal or social issues, when they never speak about heaven's will, heaven's plan, heaven's purpose, you can tell they don't sit there because in the spirit, there is something called the counsel of the Lord and everyone can access the counsel of the Lord. There are different dimensions or whatever, but prophets have a grace to sit in this council. And it's almost when you use examples, we would say the state of the union, a prophet would be in the chamber of the Lord and the Lord would speak to that prophet about what's to come, what he's planned, what he's ordained. Some people he'll speak to them about what he's planned ordained for nations, for communities, for regions, some people for leaders, for individuals, but to stand in the council of the Lord requires a prayer life. And that's why we always tell people, especially bud and prophets, you need to pray in tongues. Because when you pray in tongues, you etch out your seat in that council. And there'll be times where God will call you into this thing called the night watch. You know, there are times where you can't sleep or you're restless. And what God is calling you into is the place of prayer. And when you're in that place of prayer, you know, and I keep going back to this analogy, you always use like the matrix or frequencies because you can get to a place where you sit in that seat and God calls you into that seat because he wants to share with you what's on his heart and what he wants to do and what he's planning for individuals, for nations, for communities or whatever. But what's so interesting about that is false prophets. They don't function that way. They're speaking of the world. They're speaking you know, of the things pertaining to the flesh. They're not speaking about destiny. They're not speaking about purpose. They're mainly most false prophets. They're really going to be speaking about love. Going to be speaking about when I say love, we're talking about relationships. Relationships, they're going to be speaking about your money. They're not going to speak to stuff that converts your soul. Genuine prophets, when they speak, they're speaking from the spirit of God. And when they're speaking, it challenges your soul to mature. If you can sit under a ministry and your soul never be challenged, I say your soul, if it never leads to repentance. And by the way, let's address this word. Because people think that a repentant, per, a, a prophet of repentance, repent. You know, I see people, you go on Facebook, repent. The Lord said, repent, repent, repent. And it's like, you have to be a person that is a virgin, a person that is, um, you have to be a virgin. You have to be a, a monk. You have to hate everybody and just, you know, wear lipstick, repent, whatever weird stuff. You break down that word, repent. That word, repent is two words. Meta, where we get the word metamorphosis. And noia, where you get the word mindset. So repentance is a transformed mind. In other words, you're introduced to revelation 
that shifts the way you think. In other words, you forsake your thoughts for the thoughts of God. So if you sit under a prophet or any minister and their their um, discourse, their teaching, their, their preaching does not cause you to let go of earthly thoughts for heavenly thoughts, that's not of God. You can sit under a false prophet and your soul never begin to. Because once again, the Bible says, trust in the Lord and you'll be established. Right. It says, but believe his prophets and you will prosper. If you are connected with a prophetic voice, your soul begins to prosper. If you're not becoming healthy in your emotions, healthy in your imagination, healthy in your intellect, healthy in your personality, healthy in your perceptions, healthy in your reasoning, healthy in your desires. That's not a genuine prophetic ministry because the anointing of a prophet first calls you to prosper in your soul. But then once you begin to prosper in your soul, that's going to automatically affect your money. It's going to affect your relationships. It's going to affect everything you're doing because the place that prophets are speaking from is they're causing you to function from the mindset of heaven. And when I say heaven, heaven is a realm that we have present access to. And heaven is an invisible realm that God wants you to partner with. So his will, plan and purpose will be done on earth. But when prophets are speaking, they're speaking from that realm that challenges you. In other words, you have been systematically programmed to think a certain way. And when you meet a real prophet, they're speaking from another place. It's like countercultural. It's like, wow, like I've been all my life. I've been told I had to do it this way, this way, this way. But then a prophet comes. This is God's way of doing things. This is God's perspective. This is God's agenda. This is God's plan and purpose. And it shifts you. And then once you repent, it means I let go of this this reference point. Man, I used to believe get your money hot under a, a mattress, save, save, save. That's the way to wealth. And now I'm realizing that if I give into kingdom work, or if I believe God for an idea, or if I act on, if I cultivate or develop my, my, my skills, my talents, my abilities, then God will prosper whatever I do. That's a completely different world than what we were taught. We were taught that money don't grow on trees. You know, you got to struggle. You got to work nine to five, 40 years, whatever. But when a prophet speaks, they're speaking from a whole nother place. But once again, this prophet really is mantled by God. And we say mantle, the Old Testament mantle is a New Testament anointing. So the anointing of a prophet will actually cause you to is going to cause redemption. All the areas of your life where the devil has overtaken you and you've been a captive. When you encounter a genuine prophetic voice, you're going to be set free. Also, when you encounter a genuine prophetic voice, you're going to begin to understand this is why I was born. This is what God has planned for me. And this is where God wants to take me. If you're not experiencing that from listening to that person, it's not a genuine prophet. And that because the fruit of the prophetic is redemption and revelation. That's good. And then also like fear. A lot of people prophesy from a place of fear. And I can just tell um, when uh, fear is running rampant, that is something in the midst, right? And so I've been seeing that a lot out here, like, you know, just a lot of fear-based prophecies. Now, listen, there are warnings. The Lord has given me warnings before, um, like, hey, warn the people for this. But there's redemption, as you said, in that um, I think a true prophetic voice is going to lead you to mercy because there are no miracles without mercy. There's no prophecy, deliverance, none of that without mercy, you know, Um and we have to be, we have to be, we have to rest in mercy. We prophesy from, from a place of mercy, from a place of love, not from a place of money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you'll know the money changes that are in the church when it's just, man, it's just all like bogus. Like that's just what it's all about. As opposed to when there is true people who are doing ministry, of course you need money to do the work. And I'd believe in people partnering with the work. But sometimes, you know, I think that the people who are really operating in the grace of God and doing the work, you don't want people to feel like you are the money changer. So it's like so crazy. Have you experienced that? Like where you just be like, I just don't even want to ask. Cause like, Absolutely. but the Bible says, you know, that the workman is worth their hire. And for the people like Paul who was doing the work, like they would, the people would bring the apostles, the, their, you know, resources. Absolutely. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that um, when we were on Periscope way back in the day, there were a couple of people that was like OD with that. And, you know, it seemed like they were prospering for a while. I think there are also ministries that have faded away that really were always talking about money. You know, that stuff is short lived. I think as it relates to a minister, if you're a minister that's watching this, one of the things you have to untether for, untether from is entitlement. 
I feel like when you feel entitled to people's money, you're not going to receive it. It's going to show up in the way you speak. It's going to show up in the way you function. It's going to show up in your frustrations. What you have to do, you have to trust that if God sent you, he's going to provide for you. And then also you have to understand that people give into what they value and what they honor. So if you're really impacting people's lives, if you're really touching people's lives, they will be compelled to give. And then sometimes people just aren't taught about giving, you know, but I think one of the things that kind of freed me over this last year is I received the revelation about provision and this kind of changed my life. And I've been resting more in the Lord and understanding how provision works. I think that if ministers understood how provision works, then they wouldn't uh, be as restless concerning money. Because when you're restless concerning money, you're going to become manipulative. You're going to become shrewd and cunning on how you get it. But God knows your heart. And that's how that's one thing. One thing I learned in the prophetic is that the only motivation, the only motivation that's genuine and prophetic is love. If I go live and I'm not prophesying because I love God and I love his people, even if I receive an accurate word, which they would say, um, it's not going to hold weight. Because the Bible, the, you, you ever heard this verse? It says, speak the truth in love. You know that verse? When you look at it in the Greek, that says, be true in love. In other words, if you're not true, if your heart posture is not true, like Alexis can start to prophesy. I can start to prophesy to Alexis right now. But if my motivation is not love, no matter how true the words are, the spirit of God won't bear witness because I didn't represent God. So a lot of times we'll people will go live because they are desperate. They need their bills paid, all this weird stuff. And when you have that kind of motive, you're not going to impact people. So if you have pure hands and a clean heart and you really doing it because you love God, God rewards you. And you sometimes you have to just teach your people the power of giving because those who don't give, they're only short in themselves. When you understand provision, there's no reason you won't give, because when you give, you're actually showing that you understand provision and you're showing that you you when you're giving, basically you're you're showing that you're already blessed. But also when you give your money, what you're receiving from the Lord is grace and grace is always greater than money. So when you understand these principles about provision, you won't the people won't be afraid to give. They won't be hesitant to give. But then also you, you will understand that there's something on your life that attracts that. When you're a minister, you have a grace. And when people give into ministries, they're giving into the grace on your life. And when they give into the grace on your life, God increases the grace on their life. Because God is working on your life in a supernatural way. But you have to function in a way with purity and you understand what's going on. You can't force people to give. You can't beg people to give. And I get it. You would say, you know, well, I don't want to be like these people or whatever. But you still need it true. You read the Bible. Paul was not afraid to ask people they minister to for money. You can read Corinthians. He said, hey, we got this going on. Can you give to this? Give to that. But if the people value you. And they are submitted to you. And I say submitted when I talking about you controlling people, if they respect who you are in God and they draw from you, it's nothing to ask the people that, that you lead to give into a project. And here's the thing. This, this is a principle about that. If Alexis right now, you create a project, if people are submitted to you, as soon as they give, you step into this thing called the firstborn. And we step into this principle called the firstborn. It guarantees you receive a double portion, which means that if someone is submitted to me and I have a project I'm trying to do and they give your income will double because the, the whole principle of the firstborn is we're functioning from a place of responsibility. So we're doing this because I'm my brother's keeper. And what I mean by that is this right now, I can create some in Detroit, be like, hey, I want to have this for the homeless. Da, da, da. If people give into that, that means that we collectively are becoming the firstborn, which means I'm my brother's keeper and I'm responsible for these people. But anytime you're the firstborn, you receive a double portion. So God will honor your finances because you understand spiritual protocol. And you understand how that's going. But these are things that you know a lot of people don't know about, but it helps you because when you give the heavens honor that. And there are a lot of things that change in the natural when you're a giver. When you, when you, um, thank you for that. That was so good. When you're talking about, um, I wanted to go back to something you said about, um, how people, they like honor accuracy or something, but we, I do believe that the more that you walk with the Lord, the more accurate you are. Um, and so I kind of want it, I guess, to sharpen the believer, to trust what they hear. But also I remember my friend, he's a rapper and he would say like, if you got writer's block, you trying too hard. Mm 
You know, so in other words, I want to say the same thing with the prophetic. Like, if you're trying to be like, I just can't hear it. I just can't hear this. And maybe you're not supposed to hear that. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe you operating outside of what the Lord wants you to talk about. Like, for me, every month I write down the monthly word. Like, I write down things I hear. I hear rhymes. I hear raps. A lot of people be like, man, you remind me of, like, how Kim Clement used to flow. Like, that's how, I mean, but I'm different because I don't play keys, but I, like, that's how I flow. Like, but if I don't get a flow for that month, I'm just like, okay, I just don't got it this month. I'm going to just go like this. You know what I'm saying? Like do something like maybe I'll go with what different things he's tell, telling me. God can speak in riddles, in mysteries. That's the that's the way he does for me. But if you start doing that and that's not the way you flow, then you operate outside of your grace because that's not what you do. But God, sometimes when you sit alongside that grace, you'll find yourself doing that, right? Just like those who follow your ministry, they probably start, they probably have heavy revelation because you're a man who revelates. But I want to like, I guess, give some insight about what people can do to sharpen their gifting and their grace so that when they minister, they are operating in their spirit and truth. Okay. So I, right, so let's break down. When I the Lord's that- spirit and truth, not their spirit. Absolutely. So let's say, okay, when we talk about the prophetic, I talk about the prophetic for everybody. And then I talk about things to prophets. So let's, let's make it general for everybody. The thing about the prophetic is when you prophesy, prophecy, according to the scripture, is edification, exhortation, and comfort. So when I'm prophesying, I'm building people up, I'm comforting them, or I'm encouraging them. Now, when you prophesy, your motivation, number one, is I love people. And in order to receive a prophecy, you look up the Bible, it says that he that prophesies can prophesy as long as he had. It says he can prophesy in proportion to his faith. I like one version that's so deep. It says that he that prophesies can prophesy as long as he has faith to receive a message from God. So in order to prophesy, you have to believe that God can speak through you. But then also you got to believe that God wants to speak through you in order to comfort people to edify people or encourage them. When your heart is pure and that's your desire, God will inspire you to say things. Now we talk about the prophetic, how the prophetic starts. The prophetic starts as a flesh, which means that you're not going to have everything at one time. You're going to have the beginning. And when you step out, when you step out, that's how you get into a flow. And out of your belly begins to flow rivers. Your flow is going to be based on your level of faith. The more you do it, the stronger it gets. So I can begin to prophesy, but I have a word for Alexis. And I can say, I see. And when I, when the more I'm saying, stuff just opens up, opens up, opens up, opens up. And then when I'm done, I can pull back and it stops. That's how that goes. But um, we talk about the prophetic. Once again, your motive has to be love. You can't have no other motive, but you love people. Now, everyone does not have a gift of prophecy, but all can prophesy, which means that some people can only prophesy in the right atmosphere. This is called the spirit of prophecy, which means that if we're in the atmosphere of worship, praise or prophets of prophesying the spirit of god will fall upon you and you can prophesy because the atmosphere has been made conducive for you to prophesy that's the the spirit of prophecy which means you need an environment to prophesy nothing is wrong with that you just aren't a prophet and it's okay not to be a prophet so many other things that god has people to do but there are other people that have the gift of prophecy when you have the gift of prophecy you don't need an environment you just need faith in other words, you need to believe that God can speak through you. If you believe God can speak through you, you open your heart to receive um, a revelation from God. But then there are, there are higher tier, what we have called prophets. Prophets, are, when a prophet prophesies, they're also going to edify, exhort, and comfort, but they're going to add warning. They're going to add direction and guidance. They're going to add correction to it. So when a prophet speaks, this, it, like a prophet, a prophet has a spirit of prophecy upon them, the gift of prophecy within them and the authority of the office behind them, which means that prophets function at a higher level. Now, if you're a prophet, if you want to um, and we say accuracy for me, the reason I don't focus on accuracy when God speaks, God speaks. Um, I felt the reason I always tell people not to focus on accuracy, because once again, when you focus on accuracy, most of the time you're not going to be tuned into God. You want to be tuned into the spirit of divination or you'll be tuned into familiar spirits. So if you just want to be accurate, you want to draw from the wrong source. It's very easy to be accurate. All you have to do is want to impress people. All you have to do is want to receive information about people. When I'm prophesying, I'm not trying to receive information. 
That's why the name of my ministry is the heart is heart of God ministry in the natural. When I prophesy, I'm engaged in God's heart. What's on God's heart for these people? What's on God's heart for this person? What's on God's heart for this region? And if I'm engaged in God's heart, then God begins to share his heart with me. And I begin to share God's heart with these people. Um, but what happens is when you get into, you know, the prophetic realm, the thing you have to do as a prophet, number one, you got to be consecrated. And we get into the word consecrated. Consecration does not mean don't watch Netflix and don't, you know, don't eat, you know, fried foods. But consecration actually means that you're dedicated to God. It means that you're available only for God and you're unavailable for other spirits because there are always spirits that want to employ you. You get mad, you get frustrated, you go on live. I'm finna prophesy now. Well, guess what? The spirit that's driving you is a familiar spirit. And you're finna prophesy from the wrong source, the wrong place, but you're available to it. And a lot of times we're available to demon spirits or counterfeits, but you have to make up in your mind that I'm only available for the voice of God. And by doing that, that's like getting into the car and the only station that's on is this one station. I'm not going to go back and forth between different stuff. Um, this station I'm going to listen to, da, 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 da. So for you as a prophet, you got to be consecrated. And that consecration is in the relationship. You're engaging in prayer. You're engaging in worship. You're engaging in intimacy with God. And out of fellowship, you become more aware of God's voice. It's very, very important. you know. And if you have the gift of prophecy, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So you want to be in environments where you want to be a blessing to your friends. You know, one of the things I would do if I had the gift, I would test one of my friends, be like, hey, I want to encourage you. And I would just do da 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 And um, they, they'll get a the feedback. But I have faith because I love people that God can give me a word to bless them, encourage them, edify them and comfort them. So I'm prophesying in proportion to my faith. And I believe that God wants to use me as a vessel to be a vessel, a blessing to my friends or whatever. When we talk about the prophetic office, it's a little more responsibility because when you when you function in the prophetic office, it means that you are um, you open your mouth and you're speaking about God's will, God's plan, God's purposes. And you held accountable for the stuff you say because you're speaking in the name of the Lord. And sometimes God will like a word to come true. But if you did it in the wrong spirit, you'll be judged. You know, stuff like that still happens. But wow, that's heavy. Just like. um it makes you want to be careful to make sure you're speaking, you know, directly what the Lord is saying and not just like he says in the word, not adding to the word, not even adding to the prophetic word uh, that you hear. I had a dream about that. And um, in the dream, I was telling a girl, like, do not add anything to, you know, what God is saying. Sometimes we can want to encourage, you know, and just add on. Right. So like, OK, like out of just wanting to encourage and not even being bogus, but really just trying to encourage, but even then you're adding on and it's okay that you don't have like 525,600 things to say. Um, and I think sometimes even when you're like in a group with people, like sometimes like going at a conference or something, you know, like you have all these prophetic graces and sometimes people want to uh, perform. I can recognize when performance is happening because heaven doesn't respond. Absolutely. For me, heaven responds with glory when it's just on some random. I'm ser serious. Like I don't even know. I I like the most glory I ever felt was in um Mississippi, and we told we talked about a a healing uh, situation. My friend who got healed when I saw this hand come down out of the sky and touch her stomach and heal her. Um, and she was like really feeling like she was about to die, and this hand came down. It was glowing and it healed her. And when she went to the hospital, they could not find where the trauma was or wherever you know what was going on. But she was literally passing blood. So we shared this story in Mississippi. And we didn't have any, I'm telling you, lights, cameras, action, nothing. Literally, I came to the meeting, walked down, and I grabbed the mic, like, and just, I didn't have an bearer. I ain't had no, you know, people doing an altar. I ain't had nothing. It was just, like, my friend who played keys, my other friend. Like, we were just, you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody introduced me, announced me. I'm telling you, glory set on us that day. Like, it felt like the person of Jesus was in that room. And uh, I realized it don't need we don't need like all the lights, cameras, action, all that other stuff that is excessive, Absolutely. you know, to put on to put on like that's what really people be on. And I understand because like you, you want to do things in excellence, but trying to do things in another way or another strength. I'm telling you, like Jesus Christ, the glory of God is going to come into your meeting with a pure heart. And that's what he's looking for. You know, he's looking for pure hearted vessels. 
And I know that, you know, God has introduced you to this world or you've been out here, but is reintroducing you as a pure heart, a pure vessel to take people to another uh, dimension, to help people who are forgot about to ascend, even older people who really never got taught um, accurately or even just, you know, like taught from a place of not control, you know, like, that God is allowing you to have these schools and things that you, that you, um, that you have. Um, I guess the, one of the last things I want to ask about is as we are moving on to the prophetic, what do you think the future of the prophetic is? Absolutely. You mind if I, when you were talking, I realized, oh, I don't think I answered your question. Like I, I would, I would give like something quick, Go ahead. You were like tips to develop your gift. And I think, I don't know what I was. Oh, yeah, about. yeah, yeah. Like just real quick, one way to develop your gift is pray in tongues. The more you pray in tongues, you develop your spirit and develop your spirit to perceive the voice of God. It's very important that I would advise if you just receive tongues, you know, probably set a timer, pray, learn to pray 15, 20 minutes straight in tongues, work your way up to 30 minutes, eventually get to a place where you can pray in tongues like an hour or so. Because what's happening is you're developing your spirit. And the more, whenever you pray in tongues, you're stirring up all your gifts. But also when you pray in tongues, you're learning to perceive because praying in tongues shuts down all the outer world and it opens up your inner senses, your spiritual senses, and you become more discerning. Number two, you want to make sure that you fast. One principle of fasting is when you deny yourself, you receive. So fasting increases your spiritual sensitivity. And when you fast, you become more aware of God's voice. So through self-denial, you can access more of the voice of God. Now, we're not talking about works. We're talking about technology. So I'm not telling you to go on a 40 day fast to become a prophet. But what I'm saying is that the principle is if you humble yourself, you receive grace. So fasting is self humility. Anytime you fast, you're humbling yourself before God and God lavishes grace upon your life. And when that grace comes, you're going to be able to hear the voice of God more because you're letting God know in fasting. The most important thing to me is insight and revelation from you. Last one is reading the scriptures. The reason this is important, the Bible says the word of God is sharp in any two-edged sword. When you read the scriptures, you're able to divide between your soul and your spirit. And there are times where you think that you're hearing God's voice, but it's actually you. If you don't have the word in you, you won't be able to tell if what you're hearing is coming from you or coming from God. And here's the thing. Stuff coming from you is not bad because how God works. Let's say right now I can walk into a room. And I can tell she got something going on. She's depressed. That's my spirit. That's not the spirit of God. When it becomes the spirit of God, what I perceive she's depressed shifts into what God is going to do. Because remember, you and the Lord's spirit are one. So your spirit has intuition. Your spirit has conscience, communion, wisdom, faith, hope, like all these different gateways in your spirit. Now, when your your spirit becomes one with the Holy Spirit, what happens is you can perceive stuff in your spirit, but now you can offer it to God. And when you offer it to God, he puts revelation on it and redemption on it. So my spirit can perceive, man, she's depressed. But then God can tell me what's really going on and what's going to come from it. But if you're not praying, if you're not reading the Bible, most of the time you're going to keep what you perceived and release that as prophecy. And that's not a prophecy. That's just a perception. So that's that. Now to answer the question that Alexis just said about what I think is coming in the prophetic, I think that the idolatry of the prophetic is coming down. And I think that, you know, we made the apostolic and the prophetic move. Um, um, we made it uh, an idol and we also made it um, elitism. But those are coming down. And I think that God is, you know, pouring out his spirit. You know, he's already done it, but it's going to be a greater awareness of the spirit of God working in the individual. Also, I believe that in the prophetic move, we're going through reformation. One of the things I keep telling people is that you can tell that it's becoming like Samuel. But anytime you see that Samuel archetype, then it shows that purity has to um return. That's why when I tell when, when I talk about the accuracy thing, it's not necessarily about the accuracy, it's about the purity of heart, because purity of heart determines your ability to hear God. It says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall perceive. If you have impure motives and not a pure heart, you're not going to really be hearing the voice of God. 
but purity is returning. And a lot of the old fathers, they're dying off or they've already gone. So God is raising up those Samuels and God's going to use those Samuels to raise up the Davids. So what you're seeing, you're seeing a new leadership emerge, but then also you're seeing a new prophetic type emerge. So if you want to understand what God is doing, you need to read the book of Samuel and look at how God used Samuel to restore the prophetic because God is raising up prophetic mothers and fathers to bring purity back to the prophetic. And there's no purity in the prophetic without priesthood. One of the things you're going to see God do is God begin to emphasize the Melchizedek order. We're going to hear a lot of people start talking about the order of Melchizedek and how to function in that priesthood, because if your priesthood is off, your prophecy will be off. You can't function in an Aaronic priesthood. You can't function in a Levitical priesthood. You have to function in the Melchizedek order. And the Melchizedek order is a priesthood where you engage God face to face, mouth to mouth, and you come out of his presence as a life-giving spirit. So when you see um, Samuel, Samuel was a judge, Samuel was a priest, and Samuel was a prophet. And in the prophetic move, we're going to see that. We're going to see people being inspired to go back into the place of prayer. We want to see people inspired to bring justice and order and structure. And they want to see people be anointed to bring forth the heart and mind of God. So at the same time, you're seeing Samuel and David's emerge. We're seeing Saul's are, you know, you still you can see some Saul's now, those who are oppressed by demon spirits, those who fight, you know, the young, those who want to kill people's influence before it comes, those who are threatened by the Davids. When you see, you know, Saul and David, you would see how Saul loved David until he realized that David was coming for his position and he was threatened by Saul's growth. I mean, by David's growth and he tried to kill him. David had to be on the run for years. And there are people that are on the run right now. They have isolated themselves and disconnected from communities because they were persecuted because of their giftedness and where God wants to take them. But at the same time, you want to see Samuel's and David's emerge because we're in a reformation. And like I said, it's not I think that we, we we overly emphasize the prophetic. The prophetic is just one realm, just like healing is just one realm, just like deliverance is just one realm. Anytime you see someone overly emphasize one realm, most of the time they're in error or they're religious. But the prophetic is a technology that God's going to use to take us to where we're going. But you're still going to need those Samuels, those who can see the emerging leaders. Those who can teach the emerging leaders the laws of God, those who can teach the emerging leaders what God requires of them and whatever they do with that information or insight, that's on them. But I think that, you know, the church has become an institution where you can be great in church and you, you can be a legend in your own mind, you know, and you have no impact on society, no impact on the world. But you, when you see the real prophecy merge, you're going to be speaking to why you were born, where God wants to take you and how God's going to use you to turn the world right side up, because we're going to begin to see the mobilization of the church more. We're going to begin to see, we're going to begin to see churches emerge that are solutionists. We're going to see in the next five and 10 years, if a church is not a solution oriented church or a solutionist church, they're going to fade away. They're going to be great churches now, huge mega churches. Those leaders will just fade away and they'll leave the ministry to join other ministries as advisors to tell those people how they should be impacting the community. Because one of the things that grieves God in this hour is that we don't care for the widows or the orphans. And God's going to raise up churches that will take the place for the fatherless and for those who, who've been widowed. And that also speaks to impact in the community. We want to see churches build hospitals. We want to see churches build schools. We want to see churches build courts. We want to see different things that are relevant to society that will um, help help the church have a greater voice in society because a lot of times the church is like a mocking a laughing stock in the world because a lot of stuff we're doing it just holds no weight it's just churchy you know messages you know um we believe that we don't have to work and the money which is appearing in our bank accounts you know we believe that if we give this man a thousand dollars then you know we set for life all this weird stuff but god is awakening in the church so what i see is awakening i see reformation and I see that the heart of God is calling out for the Davids and God is speaking to the Samuels and telling them to go anoint the David. So within the next five to seven years, we're going to see so many new prophetic voices emerge. And the theme is they're going to be pure and they're going to be all about Jesus. It's not about them. It's not about their clique. It's not about their entourage. It's not about their kingdom. But they're going to be friends of God. They love God. They're going to be grieved over the things that grieve God. 
They're going to be zealous of the things that are zealous to God. And they're going to be passionate about seeing you become all God made you to be. And they're not going to monopolize your time or Lord over you. They're going to pour into you because they understand they were born for such a time as this. Those are the things I perceive about what God is doing. Woo, that thing was good to me. Heavy. Wow. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You actually said some of that to me on, um, I was on your Naba, uh, Naba, a word. And actually we were driving to, um, we were driving to, we were driving to St. Louis. So it was on a 10 hour drive and I just scrolled and I put on my earphones and I was like, okay, let me see what he's talking about. And then you just happened to see me, um, come on there and, uh, um, you know, so I received the word of the Lord that you said, I didn't even get to, to really express, you know, my gratitude for what the Lord said through you and, uh, really just, um, and your team, Nate. And, um, and it was very accurate. And, um, also that's the work I do is to say, okay, Lord, why did you have me go get a PhD? Why do you have me in social services doing work? grant funding, all of that stuff. Why, you know, and I'm also operate in this grace, you know, to prophesy apostolic work, building more for the apostolic and the prophetic. I kind of, it's a dual thing with me. So what you said was very accurate, not knowing all the stuff that we do and I do receive it. So I publicly want to say that very accurate. And, um, I, I actually recommend, um, you guys to go to his, um, when he does Naba, um, what days is that? It's um, is once a month on Thursday. So this okay. month will probably be on the one of the last two. I had to talk with Nate to see what time, which one works. But that probably- thing is tiring. I don't know how you do it, but amen. <laughs> so uh, you know, yes, Naba. I can actually um, I don't know. I could see you guys taking that off online and doing it in like a private setting, like virtual, private, virtual. I could see like people, you know, cause you're going to build your own, like a own listing, like a private back off. I don't know. It's something that the Lord's going to have you do offline. That's going to, it's going to be online, but it's going to be off like social where it's like this private hub type thing where people are going to sign up in the, in droves to come and see it. And the Lord said, he'll market that and he's going to make it uh, great. So I see where you're doing. Maybe it's a twofold thing. Maybe you'll do it online and then it'll happen to be offline. I don't know if he's spoken to you about anything like that, but um, concerning like glitches online and all that. But I just know that your voice, like people want to really sit under and connect to. And I don't even like saying under alongside with you to really learn and to to grow. And so I'm excited about part one of what God has done for your life, but now it's time for part two, even as you just had a birthday, you know? Uh And so my birthday is too. My birthday is about to be April the 10th. And Mm -hmm. so uh, I think this is the month of Nissan, according to Jewish calendar. Do you know? I don't remember no more. Oh, it's Nissan. I'm telling you, I don't really get into heavy in it, but I'm telling you, it's something with that. Anytime people have been born around this time, it'd be something prophetic. And I'm just going to say it for the April babies, even though you're the end of March, you're March 30th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, March 30th. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Well, how can people uh, connect with you like online or your classes, et cetera? Can you let us know? Absolutely. So every Friday on YouTube, I'm releasing a new video. So make sure you check out my YouTube. I've done like 15 straight weeks of YouTube videos, have a lot of stuff to talk about. So definitely do that. Also, you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook. Um, What else? Um, Also, I have a private school. I have a school for ministers or people that are just hungry for God. We talk about the mysteries of the kingdom, something called a mystic school. And mystic just means that you believe um, you can encounter God in relationship. And it believes it means that you believe in deeper things or the mysteries of heaven. So in that class, we talk about deeper things and we talk about mysteries. We talk about foundational things that equip ministers for the ministry God has given them. Or if you just love God and just want to understand deeper things in that class for you, you can go to my website, darnellcraig.com, and you can enroll in that class. Or on my website, I have a lot of online courses about the prophetic. I just discontinued my school of the prophets. Um, I had that for like three or four years. I have a lot of courses on the prophetic, but I'm in the middle of writing a book called School of the Prophets, Volume 1. So I'm going to uh, try to finish that for the end of the year, and that's going to be super good. So 
yeah, if you want to connect, you can um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Darnell Craig. Visit my website, darnellcraig.com, or um, make sure that you check out those things on the website as well. Oh, yeah, last but not least, we have an event coming up this month, actually, April 27th. We're having a, uh, a free webinar called How to Study the Bible. If you want to join that, then make sure you go on my Facebook and you click on it. I, I pinned it on my Facebook, but that's going to be deep because we want to talk about the Bible from a different perspective. You don't have to be a theologian minister. You just have to love God and read the Bible. We want to help open you up to receiving revelation from the Bible, different ways to look at it, get into hermeneutics, get into cultural worldviews. It's going to be super dope. So it's free on April 27th. I think it starts at 10. Yeah, no, that's going to be dope. I'll probably will register to you guys. So you guys register. And uh, just for the deeper, we need we need this type of gift in the body. My brother uh, has a similar way of seeing the world like you. And so I love this type of uh, uh, gifting. And I hope to have you back a third time. I'm sure the people are going to ask uh, until we bring you in person, which I want you guys to look forward to it. Hopefully it'll be this year. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again, Darnell. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I love being on here. <laughs> Well, you'll be back. I might have you host a few things. Sometimes I have people come on and host for me or something like that. I just I just love like sharing and um, connecting with real gifts. You know what I'm saying? Like and you are a real legit gift all the way over there in Detroit by way of Arkansas, Alabama, Alabama. Yeah, Alabama. <laughs> Bama. OK. All right. Shout out to Alabama. All right, y'all. Bye now. Hi, everybody.